Well, well, we know that, that story goes on, right? There were two sons. Um, it's one of those uh, great two sons stories in all the Bible. You can think of some others right away, I'm sure. Uh, can you not? Other stories about two sons? Cain and Abel? Uh, uh, Isaac and Ishmael? Um, Jacob and Esau? And then there's other two sons story that Jesus told about the two sons that the father told to go and do something. And one said, oh, I would love to do that, but didn't do it. And the other one, they grumbled and said, I get sick and tired of doing those kind of things. But he went out and did them anyway. A lot of two sons stories in the Bible, and this is one of them. Then it goes on because the second son is the older son. And you remember the story. It's kind of fun to read a story over again because maybe you see something different in it. The older son is the one who's doing all the work out in the field. Here's what's going on with this younger son, whom he never liked anyway, apparently, who comes back in and gets a party, and he gets nothing. And we'll pick that story up as well. But as far as the story was read, what scene in that story sticks out for you? Now, this is, this is a, an amazing story that Jesus told. Because it's been told so many times, it now seems it's not fiction. This is fact, right? Doesn't it seem like a story that actually happened? And if you were alive at that time, you probably would know that father. He was famous for having these two sons in this big farm and a lot of people to work for him and so forth. And it was a very living story. But it's one that Jesus made up in order we might know something about God and about ourselves, like his other stories. What segment in that story stands out for you? Is it when the younger son, who seems to have a great deal of nerve, goes to the father and he says, um, give me what's coming to me? <laughs> That's a pretty gutsy thing to say because ordinarily you don't get what's coming to you until the father dies. So what the son was saying, I'm now treating you dead like you're dead. Give me my inheritance. Hmm? That's a poignant scene. Or is the most poignant scene in your mind when the son who gets that wealth in his hand goes off and wastes it somehow and apparently is totally unable to accumulate any friends in all that expenditure of uh, money and winds up with nothing feeding pigs? Is that maybe the key, key moment in that story? For me, the key moment in that story is when it says that the father is standing at the gate looking for his son to come home. He didn't just stand there on the day that the son came home, but he would be out there every day looking. He was ignoring his work. He was forgetting about his other responsibilities. He was just out there every day looking for this other, for this son who had gone off to come back. I know I'll come back. I know I'll come back. Could it be, you know, like sometimes it happens, you get these reports, well, we think we saw your son. He was doing thus and so. We, but we hear that the land he went into is now in deep famine. We, we heard your son has fallen. Whatever we might conjecture was behind the father, he's out there peering away every day, looking for this son to come home. There is one who has written about this. There are a lot of people that have written about this. One of them is uh, Henry Nowen. Henry Nowen um, wrote about the, how it is to live a life acknowledging that you are beloved by God and your job in life is to share that belovedness with others. He writes on the return of the prodigal son and highlights this moment of God looking out, seeking to see his son returning. He says, his seeing is an eternal seeing. In his seeing, we want to see the seeing of God that reaches out to all humanity. It is a seeing that understands the lostness of all 
women and men of all times and places that knows with immense compassion the suffering of those who have chosen to leave home that cried oceans of tears as they got caught in anguish and agony and now need only to come home. The heart of the father burns with an immense desire to bring his children home. Pull them back with his fatherly authority of his compassion. Hold them close to himself so that they would not get hurt again. From the heart of his embrace, the father reaches out to his children, wishes only to heal and to bless and to say good things. That's the father. That's the father standing at the gate. There's this old rabbinic saying um, that um, God says to us, I want you to return. If you can only return halfway, that's okay. I'll go halfway toward you and meet you there. And in this story of uh, it's often called the prodigal son, but it's really the story of the loving father with two sons. That's really the title of this story. That father looking out for that son to come home. Now that son and that father have some history. And that father's um, self-esteem is kind of wrapped up in that son, right? I mean, every father's self-esteem is wrapped up in, their, in, in, in that father's children. If they do well, Father feels good. They do poorly. Oh, I wish they were doing better. But corollary to that, at least in my experience of fatherhood, is where did I go wrong? How come I didn't warn him about that? How the come I didn't tell her about that? Why didn't I do this? The father's whole self-image is wrapped up in that son. And so he's standing there thinking, I know I'll come back. I know I'll come back. I know I was too easy on him, giving him all that money and letting him go out. I should have only given him half of it. So you get the rest later. I, I, I must have made it. Don't you think he's thinking that? I made a mistake. I shouldn't have let him go. Well, I, I should have made him take a cell phone so I could stay in touch with him. Maybe I should have gone with him. Or maybe I should have sent this other brother. No, I needed him to stay home. And, you know, all these questions going through his mind. But if he comes back, it'll be all right, right? Because it'll say one thing it'll say is, I didn't mess up, right? I was right to trust him. He came back. The other thing it'll say is he's better than everybody thinks. Everybody else thinks this son of yours. He's a mess. Because look what he did. He took half of the family wealth, which is supposed to get invested back into the family business. He's not supposed to take the family wealth and go waste it in Las Vegas or wherever it is he went. No, you're supposed to invest it back into the business so that everybody will profit from it. So everybody says, that son of yours is no good. But if he comes back, it means that he's not as bad as everybody thought because he's coming back. So he's out there looking every day, out there looking, thinking, if he comes back, life will be good again. If he comes back, we can put the family back together again. Yeah? We can make it sing whole once again. We'll have him here, we'll have him with me, and he and I can get ourselves together, and we'll just be a family again. See, that fits into the series of parables that Jesus was telling is he told those three together, right? The first one in Luke 15 is the one about that we did up here about the shepherd who lost one sheep. He had 100, he lost one, only had 99. Wait a minute, I'm supposed to have a flock of 100. I gotta go out and find this other one and make the flock complete. Make it complete, make it whole. And the second story is, you know, the woman who had 10 coins, those are my 10 coins. There were the ten coins of her life savings, apparently, and one of them got lost. Didn't get lost. She lost it. She took responsibility for it. She said, I lost it. The coin I lost. And she looked everywhere. Turned the house upside down. And there it was behind the altar. You know, and she found that coin. And then her collection of coins was complete. And this father wants to find that son coming home. So the family can be complete. So it can be made whole. And you notice what happens after.
after each finds what's missing. You know what they do? Every one of them? What do they do? They throw a big party. Yeah? They have a great feast. They invite all their friends and their family to come in because the celebration is we are now one. Look, each of those parables is not just about a sheepfold. Jesus loves sheep, but it's something more important than that. It's not just about ten coins. Jesus knew that money was important. It was bigger than that. It's not even just about those two sons. It's about all of humanity. Jesus sees all of humanity as a whole. And all he wants to do, well, not all he wants to do, what he wants to do, I mean, read Ephesians, read Colossians, Paul knew this, all he wants to do is to bring all of humanity together and to make them one. And he says, we're going to do this one at a time. We're going to go out and find everyone that's lost, and we're going to bring them back. Ezekiel 34 says, this is who God is. God is the good shepherd. God is the one who says, I'm going to go out. He says, a lot of your leaders are separating you. He did. He said that. You must read our papers. <laughs> he said, a lot of your leaders separate you, and, and you make different sides, and you combat each other. He says, but I'm not going to do that. That's not who I am as God. He says, I'm the one who's going to bring you together. I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go over there, and I'm going back there, and I'm going to find all the people who are wandering around, and I'm going to bring them together, and I'm going to make them whole. I mean, it's like the whole world becoming the World Cup, right? You watch the World Cup, anybody? It's a soccer thing, right? And all these teams come together, and it'll take a long time for them all to play. And it's really interesting. Iceland, who did Iceland play? Was it Argentina? Yeah. And tied them. Oh, it's great. <laughs> it's great. But all these teams coming together. Pretty soon, they'll be the Tour de France. And you got bicyclists from all over the world coming to France in order to participate in their sport. Well, God says all the people of the world, it's just, it's just we're all involved in one sport, and it's called humanity. And we got to bring ourselves together. So Jesus tells you little stories about how this happens, right? When one's lost, you go out and find them, and you bring them in. And when they come in, what do you do? You welcome them. Yeah. Um, if anybody, and you take them to lunch is what you do, and you invite the whole congregation to come along, right? Is anybody here for the first time today? Anybody? We say, so, oh, okay, good. I thought so. So here's what we should do. We're not going to do this. I'm going to invite you to go to Demetrius with us, right? We're going to buy out the restaurant, and we're going to have dinner with you today. Um, I'll expand. I'm going there for Father's Day dinner. I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have uh, their, their, their sour beef and dumplings in honor of my German father, right? But we're going to invite you, and we would celebrate. Oh, these folks, which we never knew before, are now one among us, and we will celebrate because it's a sign of what the whole world is capable of, and that is lying aside our animosity, realizing that we're all brothers and sisters under the, under the eyes of God, and come together. So at last, at last, down the road, how many days did the father stand out there looking, never giving up, but knowing one day that son's going to come down the road, and finally he does. It's July 32nd. <laughs> Everybody said he never comes, so he's like, I'm going to and, and finally he comes down the road, and the father just gets beside himself. And he runs after the son. Now, the son is a very interesting guy. And you have to wonder about his sincerity, right? Because he's made up this little speech. The son has one problem. It's not his sin. Um, although that's what he gets wrapped up in, and that's where we like to see him. But that's not his problem. What's his problem? His problem is if he don't get something to eat for this soon, he's going to die. See? And he's living in a far country. Here's the far country. The far country is the place where nobody helps you. That's the far country. It don't matter where you are. If you're in a neighborhood, a community, and nobody's there helping you, that's the far country. And so what the son wants to do is get out of that country and get back into the country where people help each other. And that's the father's country. So he wants to get back there. So here's how you do this. If I'm going to go back home, my father is a very religious guy. So when I go back home, I'm going to have to sound religious, right? So, so I'm just thinking, 
So, because what's important to me is to get something to eat. And I gotta get into my father's good graces. So I will say religious stuff to my father. I've sinned against heaven and against you. We don't know whether he felt like he sinned or not, but we know good and well he was really, really hungry. Because what's interesting is, is that the son wants to, and we don't know his name. I think it's a shame. I think his name was Roland. But we don't know for sure. Uh, but, so he's always called the son. And it's really interesting because he wants to tell his father he's no longer worthy to be called his son, so make me one of your servants. But four times in that speech, what's the word that he refers to his father? He doesn't say sir. He doesn't say mister. He doesn't say master. He keeps calling him father. Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Well, if you're no longer worthy to be called your son, why do you still call me father? See, he just wants to get back into the father's good graces. The father loves that. He sees right through it, but he loves that because that's all he wants is for the son to get back into his good graces. And so when he comes and, and, and sees him, he runs and embraces him. Notice there is no conversation. The son seeks to repeat his little speech, but the father cuts him off. No talking. There is no talking. This is now all symbolic action. One of the interpreters of this uh, parable says the father now accessorizes his son. Anybody tell me what's a good definition of accessorize? Uh, dresses him up, right? That's what he do. He gives him a ring, yeah? He gives him shoes, very nice shoes, a nice new robe, and something else he gave him. I can't remember what it is. Maybe a Father's Day tie. I can't recall. But he dresses him up. He doesn't say anything. Son, it's great to have you back. Son, all is forgiven. Son, I don't want you. Nothing. He just accessorizes him. And then, and then he says, now that you're back, son, right now, we're going to kill the best animal we got. And we're going to have a feast. And I'm going to invite everybody around to come and receive you. It's a rejoicing kind of time. Jesus is just saying, look, whenever people come together, it's a rejoicing time. And the job of fathers is the job of everybody. And that is to make those times as numerous as possible. It is not our job to block other people from coming together. It's our job to figure out ways that we can get people to come together. Right? And to celebrate that as hugely as possible. For two reasons. One, so that the whole community will know that the best thing that can happen among us is not that somebody gets rich. It's not even that Iceland would win the World <coughs> Cup, although that would be an interesting thing. But the best thing that can happen among us is that people discover that they can live together and share life in harmony. That's the best thing, so we'll have a peace to enjoy that. But the Father has another moment. The other motive is this son who is wandering back here once wandered off. I'm going to make sure he doesn't wander off again. I'm going to make such a big deal of his coming back and calling me father that he will never be able to forget that he belongs here in the family. He belongs here in the country. He belongs here in this community and not in some far country. So he throws this huge feast. And it's all going so very well until the older brother, whose name is, uh, I think his, I don't know, I think his name is Richard. I think Richard and Roland would be good. <laughs> and Richard is out in the field and hears all this ta-da, ta-da, ta-da and wonders what's going on. Richard has no idea except maybe he knows that his dad's out there every day looking for his brother, and he's told him a hundred times, Dad, it's foolish for you to look for that guy. He's never coming back. He took your money and he's gone. He'd be ashamed to come back. He's probably picked up some strange habits and maybe even some diseases. He ain't coming back. But he came back. And now the son, who was totally wrong in his perception, not only of his brother, but also of his father, now has a problem. What's he going to do? What am I going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to complain. That's what I do. I'm really good at that. And I'm going to complain. How come he gets a feast and I didn't? Right? 
I've done all the work around here. And then you guys got brothers. And you all have brothers. Brothers talk like this all the time. Huh? My brother used to always say, Louis II, Davy II, whenever he got in trouble, he would blame us, try to get us involved. What's this for my brother? Right? I am going to have nothing to do with this. And while the younger brother comes in, while Roland comes in the front door, Richard's slipping out the back door. But notice the father. Father never gives up on anybody. The father goes out and boom, grabs him. And he, and, 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 brother says, this one who is your son, I'll call him his brother, this one is your son. And the father says to him, child, huh? child, come on, you're my son, child. It's the same word that Joseph used when they went and found Jesus lost in the temple. Well, he wasn't lost, but they lost him in the temple. And, Je and Joseph says to him, child, did you not know that your mother and father were it's the same word. Relationship going to bring you back in. And the parable ends here. It ends here. It ends with that question, not because Jesus wants us to wonder forever, wonder forever whether the older son ever came in and got into the party. That's an interesting thing to think about. But it ends with that question because Jesus wants us to ask ourselves, what are you doing to try to pull the family back together again? Who have you invited? to be a part of the family? Who have you opened your heart to, to be a part of the family? Who is it that you thought would never be included into the family, into the community, and now you open your arms to that one so that they can be there? Because one by one, we're gonna remake this world. We're not gonna build walls, we're not gonna separate families, we're gonna find ways to bring people together one by one, and someday there's going to be a great World Cup where people from all over the world come and stand together to celebrate and lift their arms and praise to God and say, God, we are one. We are your people the way we're supposed to be. And God will say, let's have a great feast and break out the bread and wine of communion all we together at the table of the Lord. But it starts with one guy coming down the road and us embracing him and feasting and celebration. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you might make us one to celebrate as one family. Lord, we pray that you might help us to enjoy so much our community our faith community, our family, our congregation, that we just with great joy reach out to others and say, come and be a part of this. Let's show the world how it is that we live together as one. We thank you for that, Father, Lord, and for your eternal vision, looking for your children to come home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.